Well, hey guys, happy Friday. Welcome back to the q and It's just me and Totoro here. It's the end of the day and I just made myself this uh, new beverage that I've been drinking and really loving. It is a chaga latte. I just take um, a little bit of uh, almond milk, unsweetened almond milk, heat it up in the microwave and whisk in one of the chaga elixir packets from Four Sigmatic. It makes a nice decaf coffee dupe latte and that uh, it has a nice kind of <clears throat> earthy rich taste that you would get from a from a nice coffee but without the caffeine and without that kind of chemical aftertaste of a lot that a lot of decaf coffees bring i i normally add the packet to my coffee but just plain and or just an almond milk it's really good i highly recommend it that way particularly for those of you who are who are caffeine sensitive, I think you'll like it. But anyways, as you can tell from the title and thumbnail of today's video, I'm going to be answering your questions about a pesky skin rash that is pretty common and pretty common this time of year, at least in the United States. Um, and it is pityriasis rosea. So in today's video, I will answer your questions about what causes this rash, what it looks like, hopefully show you some pictures, tell you uh, kind of the course of the rash and what kind of treatments there are to get rid of the rash and what you should know about it. Pityriasis rosea um, is a, like I said, a common rash. What causes it? Overwhelming majority of cases out there are <clears throat> caused by or secondary to a common cold or flu virus that passes through your body. And when this common cold or flu virus passes through your body, your immune system uh, does its job takes care of the cold or flu virus. And after it does that, your immune system, for whatever reason, decides to rebel and comes into the skin and makes this really bizarre rash, which I will describe to you and show you some pictures in a moment. Makes this really bizarre rash in your skin. Uh, kind of like, you know, maybe you had a stressful exam and you go out and have a wild night on the town afterwards. Think of this rash as your immune system doing the same thing. And the reason I want to, you know, kind of paint that picture for you is that when the rash develops, while it develops as the result of most commonly a little benign virus that passes through the body, it develops uh, long after the virus has kind of been controlled and therefore the rash is not an infection. It is not contagious. Uh, it's not something that you can transmit to other people if they touch it. Um, it is just it is just your immune system being being wild and unruly, and so uh, you know the other thing about this rash that's interesting is that while the majority of cases are due to benign cold and flu viruses, you don't necessarily have to have had a preceding cold or flu. So many times it's not uncommon for patients to present with this rash and say, I, I haven't been sick, I've been totally fine. And you know, that's the beauty of our immune system. If you, if you are a healthy in, individual uh, otherwise, um, our immune systems do a lot for us that we don't even realize. And one of those things is kind of coping with day-to-day -day viruses um, in our environment. Um, and so, you know, you may have, you may have had a little virus pass through your body and you had no clue and your immune system did all of this work behind the scenes and I don't know, it's just, now it's just kind of rebelling and it comes to the skin and it makes this rash. So that is the majority of cases because that is the majority of cases, it, this rash tends to occur in the United States in, uh, the spring and the winter months when colds and flus are more common. And when we spend a lot of time indoors with people who, who may have colds and flus, and I say spring and winter here in the United States, for those of you in Australia, Malaysia, and India that watch me, uh, you, your kind of cold flu season or when you're more likely to have this would, would be in the summer months. So, you know, here in the States, we tend to gravitate indoors and have more colds and flus in the spring and winter, but in other countries, you know, that, that might be that might occur in different months, uh, but uh, a handful of cases, uh, not as common, but a handful of cases can also be due to a medication that you might be taking. Uh, a medication you may be taking, your immune system looks at certain parts of the medicine and says, mm, "I don't know," I'm, uh, and you know again rebels and makes this rash. 
I would say it's not as, it's definitely not as common that it's medication related, but it does occur. And you know, a lot of the medications that are reported to, to cause this rash, we don't use as frequently anymore. For example, gold therapy used to be used in a lot of cases of arthritis and rheumatology, and gold was notorious for causing a pityriasis rosea-like rash. I've seen a few cases of people on the medication Flagyl or metronidazole, um, and rarely it can be triggered after certain vaccines. Certain vaccines look like viruses, and so kind of a similar, similar process. Medications of the class called ACE inhibitors that are antihypertensive medications, specifically a medication called Captopril can, can cause this, this rash. And then, then there are also a variety of chemotherapies that can cause pityriasis rosea-like rashes. Um, one called imatinib or a Gleevec can cause this. The rash starts out as something called a herald patch. That is a oval, round, scaly spot that most often happens somewhere on the torso. And a lot of times people have no clue they even have this little spot. Um, because, you know, for example, if it occurs on your back and you live alone and you never look back there, you may not even be aware that you have a spot back there. After that spot pops up, anywhere from one to 20 days after it pops up, the, the, F, the affected individual will then develop a whole bunch of spots on the body kind of all at once. And that tends to be when people, when people get, you know, it, it catches your attention, you're alarmed by it. And that's, te that tends to be when people come to the, to the dermatologist or to their, to their healthcare provider saying, oh my goodness, I've got this rash and it's spreading everywhere. So over the next few days, it, uh, it erupts and it tends to, uh, kind of spread in what's described as a Christmas tree distribution or a fir tree distribution along the torso, the upper thighs, in a symmetric fashion of these little oval pink scaly spots. That is how it most commonly presents. Uh, and it tends to spare the face and it tends to spare the palms and soles, but uh, you know, it has an, uh, an affinity for the torso and kind of thighs area. And the spots themselves, they have a little bit of a scaliness to them that in dermatology we get really excited about describing. We describe it as a uh, pteraciform scale and that it's kind of a fine little scaliness, just like a little fine little bit of dry skin on top of the spot. And it, uh, it, it even occurs in a specific area within the spot. It occurs almost like a little collar. It's described as a collarette of trailing scale. So the spreading phase, pops up anywhere from one to 20 days after that first herald spot. And then, you know, new spots appear on the body for the next approximately two weeks. And then they, they stop appearing and kind of stay, stay as is. In total, the rash itself lasts about six to 12 weeks. That's, that includes the, the, the start of the, the herald spot and then the subsequent eruption of new spots and then uh, it kind of stays stable, and then it will, it will resolve on its own. So in the majority of cases, with no treatment, this is how the rash goes. You get the herald spot, then in the next week or so, you erupt in all of the spots, you get new spots for the following two weeks, and then after that two weeks of getting new spots, uh, another period of two weeks elapses, and then you know the rash fades on its own. As it fades, first it gets really dry and really scaly and peely, and that tends to, to alarm people because they think it's getting worse. It's actually just going away, and that's how it leaves. It gets scaly before it, before it goes away. Um, so it gets very scaly. And people with um, darker skin types, African Americans, uh, unfortunately, as it as it heals and goes away, sometimes it can leave behind dark spots and light spots that will go back to the color of of normal unaffected skin slowly, but uh, are not permanent. And importantly, this rash does not scar. So there is, it, it goes away and once it's gone, it's gone. And there's no, you don't, you know, there's no, no, no stigmata that you ever had it before. And it's not, it's not contagious. And therefore you get to go back to work. You get to go back to school. Yay. <laughs> Most cases are very itchy. 
this rash is a result of your immune system kind of coming in and acting up in your skin. And in doing so, the immune system releases some little itching chemicals within the skin. You know, they're making this rash. Each of those little spots of skin are, are kind of represent little foci of an impaired skin barrier that is more more susceptible to becoming itchy. So this can be pretty uncomfortable just from that standpoint. So that's what the majority of cases of the skin rash look like. Inside the mouth, you can actually have involvement. It's fairly common. The thing is that most people don't look in their mouth, so they have no idea. But you can have little, little uh, what's called petechiae, or little, almost like little, uh, if you've ever bit, you know, accidentally uh, bitten the inside of your mouth, uh, chewing and you develop like a little blood blister, you can have you can have lesions inside the mouth that look similar to that. But as I said, most people, most patients don't, you know, have a, a flashlight. They're not always looking inside their mouth, so they don't even realize that they have it. Um, and also on the tongue, sometimes you can have kind of a funny appearing, what's called a geographic tongue associated with us. Um, I've seen that a handful of times myself. Um, so that's what, that's what it typically looks like. Um, however, um, black people, black patients have a very tend, are more likely to have an atypical presentation of this. Specifically, uh, black children are more likely to have the rash look a little different. Instead of, instead of these oval pink scaly spots, for whatever reason, um, uh, they are more likely to have little little bumps instead. Uh, I don't know why, nobody really knows why. It may reflect just, you know, genetic differences between between the groups of people as to why, why this happens. Also, young black children are more likely to have a little bit of lymph node swelling associated with it. They're more likely to have lesions in the scalp. Um, I've seen that a fair amount in, in, in children. But good news uh, for parents out there uh, in this situation, it uh, tends to last uh, only, it tends to last a shorter period of time in, in young black children. So those are just some differences in you know, racial groups as far as how the rash presents. But how do you know you have it? Well, it's important to receive the diagnosis from your healthcare provider rather than ever, ever, ever trying to self-diagnose. Um, there are so many skin conditions out there that look an awful lot like pityriasis rosea and are not pityriasis rosea. Sometimes even I struggle to make the diagnosis only on clinical findings alone, only on looking. Um, you know, I have to do some other tests and things to rule out other possibilities. One other possibility that can look an awful lot like, th like this rash is ringworm, uh, tinea corporis, a little fungal infection on the skin. So, you know, that, that's something else that it could be. Psoriasis is another skin condition that can look like this. Uh, not to alarm you, but probably one, one skin condition that looks an awful lot like this is uh, a, a rash associated with syphilis. Um, and I mentioned earlier in the, in the video that um, pityriasis rosea tends to spare the palms and soles, whereas the rash of syphilis will affect the palms and soles. So that can be a, you know, a tip off. But there's a simple blood test that is also can be ordered to distinguish the two. And it's a very cheap blood test as well. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty low budget workup. And, you know, very rarely, um, if I suspect that a medication in particular is, is potentially the culprit, a, a skin biopsy can be helpful because in those cases that are associated with a medication rather than a virus, um, there will be a particular type of immune cell in the skin. Sometimes you can see it, not always, but sometimes you can see it and that helps, helps the clinician know that it's related to a medication. If I suspect a fungal infection, I could do a little scraping, um, a, a skin culture. So there are, there are other things that can look an awful lot like this. So you wanna make sure you have the right diagnosis. So never, ever, ever attempt to self-diagnose. Um, can really go down the wrong path, especially in the case of syphilis, because if it is syphilis, <laughs> the treatment is an antibiotic and then you're cured of the syphilis, uh, which is very important. <laughs> In my Q&A last week, I talked all about tinea, uh, pityriasis versicolor, tinea versicolor. It can look an awful lot like, like pityriasis rosea. All right, so what can you expect? For the most part, particularly those cases that are associated with a viral infection, a, a preceding viral infection, they're gonna go away on their own with no treatment whatsoever. 
The cases that are going to be a more protracted tend are, are those that are associated with the medication, particularly if you're continuing to take the medication. Um, so that's why it's important also to see your healthcare provider if you're, you know, to make sure it's not related to a medication that you could be taking and continuing to drive this. So those cases tend to be more, more stubborn, but those cases, you know, the most common cases associated with a virus, they go away on their own without any treatment, which is great. And they have a very low recurrence rate, meaning once they go away, they very rarely come back again. Uh, you know, less than 2% of people ever get it again. So I, I usually tell people, you know, it's gonna go away and you're most likely never, ever, ever gonna have to deal with this again. And, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time I'm right. <laughs> now, while treatment is not usually needed in order to clear the rash, it, as I said, it can be very itchy and that's uncomfortable and we don't want people to be uncomfortable. So it's not, you know, out of the, out of the realm of, of reason to prescribe a topical steroid that will help to help to put the brakes on the itch and make make you more comfortable so you know that that's commonly prescribed for this but it's more to it's more to just soothe the itch and if you're somebody who is coping with this skin condition the advice and the recommendation that i always make and is, is prudent is to be very 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 uh, conservative with what kind of skincare routine that you're doing on your body I tell people to limit their bathing to no more than once a day uh, keeping their shower short to no more than 10 minutes and avoiding really hot water and I also tell people to avoid soap on the rash uh, and if you are really dirty or feel like water is not enough to clean the skin, I recommend a bath oil or a cream cleanser that's much more gentle. And the reason this is important is that soap dissolves the, you know, soap is great at dissolving dirt and take and, and, and remove, helping it to go away, but it doesn't do a great job distinguishing dirt from your, your natural waxes and lipids and that's already impaired on those spots of rash. And so if you put soap there, it's gonna just further agitate it, make it more uncomfortable. And if you are somebody particularly with a darker skin type, make it more likely that it will heal with dark spots and white spots that will stick around a long time um, and be a pain for you. So I, I recommend just avoiding soap uh, for at least the period of time when you're coping with this. And then using a plain uh, fragrance-free moisturizing cream to the body. It's really important to avoid any irritating fragrances or perfumes or lotions, scented lotions. This is not the time to go to Bath & Body Works or Lush or any of those places and get fun, fun scented creams or you know bath bombs. That uh, that can really irritate this. So. You know, you guys know I love CeraVe. For those of you guys in the in Australia, and I think UK can get this as well, I recommend QV skincare, um, their moisturizer. I'll list all these down below for you guys. Um, also, Cetraban, Cliniderm, these are fantastic choices to use as moisturizers to the rash. Will help, help the skin barrier to begin to repair itself, to recover from the rash, and also help alleviate some of the itch. Um, so that is what I write, that is, that is a recommendation and, you know, topical steroids may be prescribed to help cope with the itch. Um, <clears throat> but in rare cases, for whatever reason, the rash can persist longer than typical in some people. Why that is, we don't know. And in those cases, uh, sometimes in order to help it go away a little bit faster, uh, I have used phototherapy, which is light therapy with, believe it or not, UV light, a specific wavelength. So not like what you would get in a tanning bed and not like what you would get from going outdoors. There you get, there you get like, like a dangerous dose of UV, whereas um, in the phototherapy, phototherapy setting, you get a very specific dose of, of UV. So it is safe and is monitored. Um, so rarely, you know, I've had to, I've had to do that as a treatment just to help clear it up a little bit faster. And that tends to work. And <clears throat> Many people, many dermatologists will prescribe azithromycin. It was observed once upon a time that that helped clear it faster. It's actually a, for a study fairly recently that showed that it was not effective. So I don't do that, but some people do. And you know, that's a clinical experience that, that it makes a difference. Uh, but you know, every dermatologist is kind of different as far as how they approach it. I tend to not use that though. So that's everything as far as pityriasis rosea, what most likely causes it 
kind of the course and you know the treatment approach. I hope this was helpful to you guys. If you are somebody who has this currently, you're going through it, my heart goes out to you. It while it is while it's not dangerous and goes away, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time you never get it again. It is it is not fun to go through. It's itchy, it's uncomfortable. Um, so I hope this video is helpful to you and kind of clarifying the nature of the, the disease process and course. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.